very good morning to everyone this morning and welcome to those who are here and those who are getting the uh, broadcast streaming live or who will pick it up later on today. What a great, great, great day we're having this morning here. A really nice drop in the temperature and humidity. Uh, what a blessing and, and like I always like to start the service off with is, you know, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so today as we come before you today and we have our call to worship today, we go to the book of Philippians in the first chapter of Philippians, verses 9 through 11. And in here Paul writes, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep growing on in the knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. And in that, often we have to understand the best way to influence someone or to bless someone is to pray for them. And that's what Paul is calling us to do as a community of believers is to pray for one another. Lift them up so you can help edify them and so they can live that fulfilled life that Christ has planned for them. And he goes on in there and his prayer for the Philippians was that they would know a unified love so that together that love would flow through with one another. Their love was that greater knowledge of Christ that becomes deeper as we have that relationship fulfilled in Christ. And that Paul prayed that the uh, Philippians would be able to differentiate between right and wrong, good and evil. And that they would know what was vital in their lives and what was really trivial. And focus on those things that really made a difference in their lives. And I think that's a big stumbling block even today for us as Christians is a lot of times we focus on the things that are really trivial. And it stumbles us. It, it keeps us from living that fulfilled life. Whereas if we focused on the things that are truly vital in our lives, we would be fulfilled in that relationship with God. So I invite you to, if you have your Bibles, to look up the verse in Hebrews 5, verse 14. And that talks about that need for discernment. And we need to pray for moral discernment in our lives so that we can maintain our Christian values and our Christian morals today. So thank you again for coming and being with us today. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, whose love is big enough to surround the entire earth, Lord, you can lift us all up today. Let the beauty of your day, the blessings that you have for us today, shine through to the entire world. Help us to have that discernment, to understand what's vital in our lives, and that is that true and glorious relationship with you. Help us to cast aside those things that would keep us from having that relationship with you. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless Pastor Terry as he gives his message that you had given to him today, that we would be blessed. Father, we just thank you, as Mark said, for this beautiful day that you've given us, that we can come before you, Father, and talk about spiritual things, Father. Father, be in this house, be in our hearts, let us hear your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So lately, we've been dealing with a lot of things where we've been dealing with our comfort levels, comfort levels in many different situations, and probably many conversations. Mark and I were just having a conversation about the comfortableness of a conversation that he has had uh, over the past few weeks with some folks. And, and 
there's some things that come into play when you have a conversation, whether it's comfortable or not, is someone making eye contact with you. Um, but if they're making so much eye contact with you, has it started to get just maybe a little bit awkward? Or is it that they aren't even making eye contact at all? Are they just kind of looking down and shuffling their feet and not paying much attention to you? Um, then there's that, my favorite. When people get in your personal bubble, get a little too close. It's like, especially right now, we want that social distancing. It's like, can you step back about six feet, please? There's also times and places for conversations. Um, and conversations are meant for more than just one person. It's a two-way conversation, not just a one-way conversation. And have you ever had that conversation where somebody walks up to you and they start talking to you like an old friend and it's like, okay, I can do this without saying their name because I certainly can't remember it. Oh, my, one of my personal favorites. Gets awfully uncomfortable when somebody's sharing too much information. We have sometimes a tendency to overshare. So what in the world could that possibly have to do with talking about spiritual things? How can this tie into today's message? Well, today we're going to be talking about a couple of different uh, of the spiritual gifts out there. One of those will be uh, speaking in tongues. And I know that makes a lot of people uncomfortable to talk about that. And then also we're going to be talking about prophecy. And these are the two things that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians 14. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, go ahead and pull up your uh, Bible app or, or open your uh, Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we're going to be uh, concentrating on a pretty good bit of scripture here. We're going to be going through verses 1 through 33 today and really talking about um, what those gifts are and how they affect the church. What, what part of, do they play in the life of the church? Now, part of this is going to stem around from different beliefs of those spiritual gifts. See, the simplest breakdown of spiritual gifts right now is that there are continuationists and cessationists. So those who believe that the spiritual gifts continue to today, and those who believe... Now the cessationists, they don't necessarily believe that all spiritual gifts have stopped. What they do believe is that the miraculous spiritual gifts have stopped. So the gifts of healing, and the gift of speaking in tongues, and... Uh, healing, tongues, and prophecy were all included in those, and, and cessationists believe that they ended a long time ago. Now, I found it interesting what I found in the Encyclopedia Britannica of what it says about, and these miraculous gifts are also called charismatic gifts, and this is what it says. It says that charismatic gifts such as uh, speaking in tongues have occurred in Christian revivals of every age. In the same vein, a German work called Sauer's History of the Christian Church, cites a reference to the famed leader of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, stating this, Dr. Martin Luther was a prophet, evangelist, speaker in tongues, and interpreter in one person endowed with all the gifts of the Spirit. Now, you may have experienced one of these spiritual gifts in your walk. I remember listening to a pastor come in. He had been at a revival in India. And he, think about how you would accept this message. He stood at the front of the church and he said, I was at this revival and this person, they were praying for uh, health of their teeth because their teeth were nearly completely rotted out. And he in person watched as those teeth turned to teeth of gold. Now, there was no dentist there doing work. There was no uh, Novocaine involved, no drilling. It was just a miraculous healing. And then in my own walk, and we often talk about the walk to Emmaus here at Grace Street. It's, uh, 
it's something that we very much believe in and it's a, a wonderful spiritual walk uh, to go on. But on my personal walk, uh, there was a young man sitting next to me during chapel one night and he said, would you go up and pray with me? I said, absolutely. What, a, what an honor and a privilege to go up and pray with someone. But as I got up there, and, and this happened at, at the old Salem church. So if you've ever been in that church, it was up on the altar. And somehow I ended up on my hands and knees. My head was against the back wall of, of the altar. And Kevin was on this side and Pastor Marty was on this side. And I was hearing words come out of the pastor's mouth. And they were not a language that I understood. I, I know English. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with English. I think we could all do better. I took French in high school. That's all they offered. It wasn't either of those. It was a language in which I had never heard before. And in that moment, because I never considered myself to have the gift of interpretation, but I believe in that moment that God allowed me to hear what pastor was saying. And what it was, was a battle. There was a battle going on for me between heaven and hell. I had some things in my life that I needed to work out, and that weekend changed me. But, what, and I don't remember everything he said, but I remember it being that battle. So when people say, I don't believe that they still exist, I tend to disagree with that because I've experienced that and I have seen healing. So I, I, both of these still exist. So um, all that to say is as we go through today's scripture, what I want you to do is I want you to let the spirit lead you. I want you to be open to what Paul is saying here in the scriptures. And I pray that today that you were challenged by the Holy Spirit in truth and love, because that's what the scriptures do. They challenge us in truth and love. And through the scriptures, this letter of love that God left for us, that we would hear the message that he has for us. So with that in mind, let me remind you that Paul ended the chapter before this. And certainly it wasn't a chapter when he wrote it. That was something that came much later. But for our purposes, in, in chapter 13, he ends uh, that chapter of the letter to the Corinthians with this verse. Verse 13. It says, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So that sets the framework for what we're going to go into here in chapter 14. So let's start by going through the first few verses. Of this. And your Bible may show it differently than, than the one that I'm using. But it, in my Bible, the header, there's a heading in here. It just says tongues and prophecy. So here, here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, let love be your highest goal, but you should first also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. But one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. And I wish you all could speak in tongues, Paul says. He says, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues. Unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. He uses chapter 13 to set this all up so that love is the highest goal as part of this because it's about strengthening the church, whether it's speaking in tongues or prophesying. It's about doing it in love. And between these two gifts, Paul sees prophecy as having the greater benefit to the church. Now, We've touched on this before. I've heard Pastor Mark preach on this, and, and we've ta I've talked about this before. The ability to prophesy can include predicting the future events, such as what the Old Testament prophets did. And, and many believe that this type of prophecy has ended, because when the canon was closed, 
there was nothing more to add to the book. So our main purpose of prophecy today is what I believe is providing understanding. It provides warning. It provides correction, which that can be uncomfortable. It also provides comfort and encouragement from God's message to the people. How many of you know someone who is going through something horrible right now? Maybe it's, it's an illness. Maybe it's, you know, here we had uh, this past week a gentleman that I didn't know, but I come to find out, is t knows people that I know. He's had cancer for several years and he's been battling it and he now has dementia. He was missing. People found encouragement in the scriptures because in God, the scriptures tell us God blesses us. He, he can take the worst of things and make them good, right? So that his family was worried about the storms. Yet it was because of the storms that a worker went out to check on something and fix something that he was found. So God provides, even in the midst of all of those things going on, he provides comfort and encouragement in his message to us. Now, Joel, who was an Old Testament prophet, he prophesied this, and this comes from chapter 2, verse 28 of Joel. It says, then after doing all these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people, not just a few people, but all people. And he's speaking to the, the people that accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And he goes on and he says, and your young men will see visions. Can you imagine? We see things. You know. How many times have you had this feeling, overwhelming feeling that God is telling you to do something? Maybe it's, hey, you need to uh, stop at the store and buy a gallon of milk and take it to somebody. Or it may just be this person over here, they need a word. They need a, an encouraging word. And it may not even be from the scriptures. It may just be going up and, and talking to them and, and encouraging them in their life. See, God wants us to know him. And through prophecy, we can. Prophecy could be also anything from teaching a sermon. So like we're doing today, right? It could be a Bible study when we're teaching and, and leading and, and helping to understand things. Or it could be just a spirit-filled message that is spontaneous, not even planned. I call those God's divine appointments. He's already set it up for you. We just need to make sure that we're there and not late. Prophecy, therefore, then, is able to be understood in the moment, which is different from speaking in tongues. So speaking in tongues, it's not a bad thing. Some people think it is. It's not a bad thing, but it does have a time and a place. And it does cause some Christians to struggle, especially when it comes to having a conversation as to whether or not it actually still exists or if they've actually experienced it. Oh, that person, they're just crazy. They're just gibbering. There's nothing to it. But if we are paying attention and there's someone there that can interpret, there's there's things that can happen. And I know we've talked about it. Uh, I remember Mark just here a few weeks ago, he was talking about if, if we're speaking in tongues and there's no one there to interpret, it, it doesn't do any good. They could just be doing it for themselves, which is part of the problem with the Corinthian church. They were prophesying and speaking in tongues to make themselves feel better, kind of puffing out their chest and look at me, look what I can do type thing, right? So that's where things started causing issues in, in the church and why Paul felt compelled to write this letter of correction to them. It's not about self-importance. It's about bettering others. And it's not about putting someone else down. Look at what I have for a spiritual gift. What's yours? That's like, what, third grade? My dad can beat up your dad type attitude which is the wrong attitude to have. So remember what we've been saying during this entire series on spiritual gifts and what we talk on Wednesday nights. 
Spiritual gifts are meant for the benefit of the whole church, not just a select few. But Paul, he does make several points about speaking in tongues. He says it is a spiritual gift from God, and it is a desirable gift when used properly, and then it can be helpful because you are in tune with the Holy Spirit. Wednesday night, um, we were, as we were talking about this, actually this section we were in, and Mark was talking about a prayer meeting that he was at, and they were all praying in the Spirit, and they, there was a connectedness there. But I think what caught everybody off guard is when he said, at, at some point, I said, they've been praying for a very long time, they all just started to giggle. And they started to laugh. But that didn't take away from that. This was the joy that God was bubbling up inside of them as they were praying. So uh, speaking in tongues should only be used in corporate worship if there's someone there to interpret. And Paul does say it's not as important as prophecy because it does not have an immediate impact. But Paul does continue on to, to help us understand this a little better. Listen to what he says, starting in verse 6. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, if, you should come to, if, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. Even lifeless instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they are being called to battle? It's the same for you. If you speak to people in words they don't understand, how will they know what you are saying? You might as well be talking into empty space. Now, there are many different languages in the world, and every language has meaning. But if I don't understand a language, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it. And the one who speaks it will be a foreigner to me. And the same is true for you. Since you are so eager to have the special abilities the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. Now this drops us back to 1 Corinthians 12, 7, in there, where Paul writes, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So the message must be understood clearly. And so in the example of the flute or, or the harp, if the notes aren't played clearly, number one, it's probably going to hurt your ears a little bit. You know, you hear that I can think of a squeaky violin. Um, things, it's just not, you don't know what, what's that song you're playing? And, and the same thing goes with the bugle or, or a trumpet, which was used long before we had our, our electronic devices for communicating. You know, at, in the biblical times, it was used as a way to communicate. It was for fanfare. And it was used in battle. Here's the example that came directly to mind. It comes from Joshua. And in chapter 6, they're talking about Jericho. And God is saying, this is what I need you to do. I need you to all walk around Jericho once a day for six days. And this is what I want you to do on the seventh day. And he says, when you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can. And guess what happened? The walls fell. Now, this was two pieces. There was prophecy about what to do and what would happen. But then there was also hearing it clearly. See, if they had not played the trumpet properly, if the people had not heard the trumpet, they wouldn't have known to yell. And they wouldn't have known to yell, the walls wouldn't have fallen, and they would not have taken the city. Same goes with our army. Way back before even George Washington had given any, was given any kind of command, the bugle was used to tell you to get up, when the meal was, when it was time to go to bed, and most importantly, when to go into battle. It helped them know what time it was. So if the wrong call were made, it cost lives. People would die. So if you don't know the song the musical instruments are playing or the sound that the bugle is making, they are of absolutely no use to us. So if we are speaking in ways that don't make any sense, the words are useless to you. 
Paul made it clear at this point that speaking in tongues was not valuable to the whole church. And, if, and as you're reading that, that's what you come to the conclusion of, right? But he's talking to the Corinthian church specifically because of the way that they were using that. It's in the next part of this chapter that Paul talks about what can be done about this. Starting in verse 13, he says, So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well, then what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit, and I will sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you are saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. So I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you, but in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. So since the Holy Spirit is the one speaking through someone, the speaker doesn't know what is being said. And in order for the speaking of tongues to be beneficial, someone has to interpret. So this goes back to uh, what we've been teaching about the body of Christ working as one. We all have our gifts. You know, Mark, that first week that we got an overview from Pastor Mark where he talked about the gifts of the Spirit. And he also talked about the fruits of the Spirit and how they went hand in hand, right? They come together because there's the preachers and the teachers and there's also those who serve. So everything comes together. There are those who speak in tongues and those who interpret. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says this. It says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Paul needed the, the Corinthians to understand this. And in praying and singing, me personally, when I'm praying or when I'm singing, I'm pouring myself out to God. And I may not be in tune when I'm singing. And you know what? I've come to the conclusion that's okay. It's a joyful noise, as we often will call it, right? That's okay. But when that happens, there's a connectedness. And when we sing together and when we worship together, there's a connectedness. And when this happens, it, it causes me to think, and, and there's so much more than a feeling. It causes me to think, and there's more than it to an emotion. Because when you go, to, say you go to a, a conference, you know, I know the guys we've gone to, uh, some of us have gone to Promise Keeper, some of us have gone to Iron Sharpens Iron, and we leave there, and we are pumped up, we are ready to go, and Monday hits, and it's like we hit a brick wall. Where, what happened to that high we were on? There's more to it than that. When we go to those conferences, or when we come to church, or when we go to a Bible study, we're, we're being challenged by the scriptures to also think. So it's a combination of the knowledge of God, the passion and love that we have for him. And honestly, that can get very difficult to put into words. It really can. So in having someone to interpret then we can all agree with them. We can say, amen. Or a, so it is. Putting a stamp on it to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Now, in the scripture from our call to worship this morning, Pastor Mark read verses 9 through 11 of Philippians 1. But I'm going to reread verse 11 real quick. It says, may you always be filled with the fruit of of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. You see, understanding is important. We have to understand. So Paul goes on here, uh, and he says, Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but be mature in understanding of this kind. It is written in the scriptures, I will speak to my own people, through strange languages, and through the lips of foreigners. But even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. 
So you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church meeting and hear everyone speaking it in an unknown language, they will think you were all crazy. But if all of you are prophesying, and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. So think about this. What if people who don't believe came into worship with us? Hearing prophecy, they would hear the word of God in a way they could understand it, and we truly try very hard to make sure that when we are up here and giving a word of God or we're in our Bible study, that we're talking in a way that's understandable, that's relatable to your life. And if we're hearing someone speaking in tongues, yeah, we definitely would start to wonder, especially if you'd never heard that, been exposed to it. It's like a little weird. If there's someone there to interpret, though, between the prophecy and the speaking of tongues, then a non-believer can understand and be convicted by the word of God. And the way the Corinthians were speaking in tongues was helpful to absolutely no one. Same way with their prophecy. It was all puffed up and about them. It's for this reason that Paul called them to account. He, he, he said, Here, here's what you need to do. He puts, out, he puts out the end of this. He puts out a call to orderly worship. He says, well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time. And someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. Now let two or three people prophesy and let the others evaluate what is said. I'm going to stop right there for a second. When you hear the word of God from someone else, and don't just take their word for it. Grab your Bible, open it up, and read and pray so that you can truly know that they are speaking what God says. And then it goes on to say, but if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. Have you ever been in a service where someone stands up and says, I have a word from the Lord? It can be a little different the first time you see that or hear that. But when that happened, the first time that happened to me, I remember when this person did this. They stood up and they said, I, I have a word from the Lord for you. And it was actually part of a time of sharing in the service when they stood up and said this. And then they had heard something in the sermon and God gave them a little bit something else. And I know this happens when we do our communion meditation uh, after the sermon. God will speak to Mark and I. And, and when we get ready to do communion, it's like, I have an extra word from the Lord for you. Just a, a little bit of clarification that I want to throw out there. That is doing exactly what the scripture says. So in Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the message be about Christ in all its richness. Fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with the wisdom he gives. Sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. See, everyone needs to contribute. We can't just sit in a pew or sit in a chair and listen to a sermon or uh, sit in a Bible study and listen to be what's being said. We need to participate. Now, there's different ways to participate. You may be singing. You may be playing an instrument. You may be preaching or praying. 
You might even be asked by the pastor to come up and read scripture. Or you may be serving. You know, in this age of technology, we have PowerPoints. We have you know, video cameras that we're using to broadcast our sermons. You may be asked to do that. Or God may call you to tell you, hey, you need to go ask about helping with this. Or maybe just simply giving of yourself. However you're participating, do it in love. That's what Paul has, he ended the last chapter and he started this one off with that. It has to be done in love. And, and Paul does dial back the numbers who are speaking in tongues and prophesying. This is so things will be done not to take away from the Spirit or what the Spirit is doing, but to keep things orderly because the Corinthian church, they just, they were all over the place. And he was trying to dial them back in. Yet now, he also then tells the church in Thessalonica, he says this in chapter 5, verse, starting verse 19, he says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. So Pastor Mark and I, we'll get up here and we don't have any intention of going two or three hours. But if the Holy Spirit led that, I'm pretty sure we would both lead or follow and go with that. Here's the thing. If we jump all the way to the end of this chapter and go to verse 40, it says, be sure that everything is done properly and in order. That's what he leaves them with. Done properly and in order. Prophecy in tongues, whether you believe in part or all of them, doesn't matter at this point. That's not what I'm trying to, to come across. I'm saying that they both can be important and they both can be uh, valuable to the church. But what Paul is telling us specifically is that prophecy is immediate. It, it, it provides, an, in our society, we are a society of immediate satisfaction. Oh, we scroll through our social media feeds, boy, those little short videos or little short stuff. You know, I was talking with my, my, uh, one of my daughters this weekend and, we both agreed that since the advent of social media and swiping and the shortness of it, reading an actual book, which we both love to do, I have a, a library that has way too many books in it, and I, I grew up and I would read all the time, but since social media, um, this little finger flick has taken over that on my phone or on my tablet or even on the computer, and I don't read as much as I'd like to. Maybe it's time to take a holiday. Maybe it's time to spend more time starting with this book and then reading some others alongside of it. This is the most important one. So as we close out this time of, of God's word, know that we do things for the benefit of the whole church. Again, as we go through this spiritual gifts uh, Bible study that we're doing in this series, it's important that we understand that it's about the whole body of Christ coming together for the benefit of the whole body of Christ. And that goes beyond the people that are in our four walls. It goes out, and it means reaching others for, for Christ as well. Father, your word is important. Thank you for Paul's message about prophecy and speaking in tongues and how they are to be properly used. Father, let us use your words to reach your people so that no one should perish, but that all should come to know you. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Thank you for that message, Terry. As we come into our time for communion today, uh, I invite you to think about that and, and think about the message that comes with our spiritual gifts is that we are supposed to do it in unity, in communion with one another. And that's really a joining together of these messages, these things that 
uh, God places upon our hearts as the community of believers, as in being one body. And so as we think about communion today, think about that, that we are partaking of these elements in communion with one another and in unity with one another. On the night that Jesus was given up, as he was having dinner with the disciples, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup and after he blessed it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you take of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. He was sharing his body in unity with all those who would believe. And the grace that is given to us by the act of communion is that forgiveness of sin. And we need to remember that that grace is alive today. And it is open for those who believe in him. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. So today I would like to uh, offer up prayers uh, as we do on Wednesday nights here when we have our Bible study. Uh, immediately following the Bible study we have a prayer time uh, where we can lift up the body of Christ and those who are outside of our immediate body. We can lift them up and we can edify them and they can be healed in the process. So does anyone have any prayer concerns they would like to lift up today or praises, uh, anything that uh, you would like to share? I invite you, if you are online and listening, you can share with us, go to our website, you can turn in any prayer concerns, any praises, anything that you may have that you would like to share. Uh, you can do it online and we will go ahead and, and pray over that on Wednesday as well. So let's go to God at this point in time. Father God, we just lift up this broken world to you today and we ask for your grace and your mercy. We come before you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We repent of our sins and we ask forgiveness today. We ask that you would bless our entire community. We ask that you would lift up those into your care and comfort, those who are hurting, those who are sick, those who are searching, those who are lost and need to come back to you and be found. Lord, we live in a lost world right now and we lift up the world to you. We lift up our nation and our community to you. That through your love, that they might come into that right relationship with you today. Lord, we ask that as we lift up these people in prayer to you today, those who are hurting and those who are sick, Lord, put your healing touch on them. You are the great physician, Lord. You know the healing that they need. We just pray today and lift them up to you that you would give them that healing, that they would come to know you fully and have a blessed life. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us.